Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Today's teaching text comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is the word of the Lord. There was an article in the New York Times called These Divided States. The United States is no longer united. President Biden, uh, in his election speech, stood up and said to everybody, I know a bunch of you didn't vote for me, but give me a chance. I'll be your president too. I can unite the nation. The next day, three headlines from three major newspapers. Voters are angry and divided. Divisions are only growing wider. America is in a cold civil war. It just seems like uh, our society as a whole has broken down. Sociologists have a concept called imagined community. And it's not, it's not your little fairy tale club that wish you could be a part of. It's basically the way societies or communities function together. And it means that every individual in that community, regardless of their story or their location or their ethnic background or socioeconomic background, when they close their eyes and they name that community, they can see themselves as a part of it. And that's how nations exist. But America is no longer an imagined community. You take somebody from Seattle and somebody from Alabama and somebody from Florida and somebody from Maine, and you ask them what it means to be an American, and you will not get something coherent enough to build a sense of us on. We have taken our sense of belonging and identity from people that we like and people who are like us. A gay kid in Alabama has more in common with a gay kid in Germany than another American who doesn't share his worldview around sexual ethics. So our world is fragmenting apart into these tiny groups. And as a result, what's happening is there's, there's no way to form a sense of belonging anymore. And so what it does is it makes us suspicious of other people who don't share our views. How many have noticed um, that people around you have lost friendships over politics? Anybody notice that? There's all these accounts. People have been friends for 30 years, and they find out that someone voted for a certain candidate, and like, this thing's over. You're canceled as my friend. 30 years thrown away in a moment, just deep divisions, deep hostility, deep fracturing. And as a result, we're living in a world where the typical person is selfish, meaning it's got to be what I want, and then suspicious of everybody else that doesn't believe the same thing that they believe. Anne Lamott said this, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people that you do. And we're bringing people together in such a way that we are the good people who have the right perspective and opinion on everything and then them, those people, we're suspicious of them. We live in a world of dis division, narcissism, and contempt. Well, how do you build a Christian community in the midst of that? How do you build a Christian community? Because this is a challenge all day long. 24 hours a day, in your dreams, you are being socialized into that cultural reality, which means your imagination, your thinking, your habits, your practices, the media are all reinforcing this narrative of selfishness and suspicion. And so it's really, really hard to be indoctrinated with that much propaganda all week long and then leave it at the door and come in and just be the people of God. I know I'm shaped by that all week, but I just leave that at the door and I just come and love. It doesn't work like that. The stuff gets in us and it affects our heart, it affects our thinking. But more than anything, it affects how we love and how we deal with conflict. 
Well, the Philippians dealt with similar problems. They lived in a divided time and in a divided world, and they lived with the church experiencing conflict. And so the Apostle Paul was writing to them to stop the culture shaping them so that they could be a community of love unlike anything seen in the Roman world. And I think that's the opportunity that we have to. We have to reclaim and build a church in the midst of this divided and cynical world that models an alternative way to belong. So my sermon tonight is simple based on our teaching text, but I believe it's potent because it's getting to the very nature of what it means for us to be us. We've got to guard against the poison of selfishness. Number two, we've got to build on the grace of Jesus, which sounds so easy and nice, but is almost impossible. And number three, we've got to have a a radical, other-centered love. So let's find a way to be a united, welcoming community based on the grace and love of Jesus and push back on the poison of selfishness. So let's have a look at what Paul says in this passage. Number one, guard against the poison of selfishness. Verse three, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing. That's a totalizing statement. That's not like, hey, why don't you guys struggle with this and work it out over a year in commute? No, it's just like, don't stop that. Don't do that. Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Now, this language is a, is a little weird, particularly this word vain conceit. How many of you are like, well, in my CG, you know, it's been a tough week because I've been struggling with vain conceit. So I need you to pray for me. I'm really struggling. I've got a vain conceit stronghold. It's not, what do we even mean by this? It's not even a word that we talk about in our world. But I want to tell you something. This world, sorry, this word contains more explanatory power about the dysfunction of this city than most of my psychologists will get in, in a year of counseling or study. Vain conceit is the combination of two Greek words, empty and glory. And what it's saying is that, is that the people struggle with a glory deficit in their lives. Now, the glory, as you know from the Old Testament, could bodice this sense of significance or weight, literally a heaviness. When someone is a glorious person, they walk in, you say, man, that was glorious. You mean it was significant, it was weighty. Now, the Bible says this. Let's see if you, if you can finish this verse. For all have sinned, falling short of the glory of God. It means there's a glory that you are designed to have as a person. But because of sin, it's gone. So there is a deficit between your destiny and your reality that sin has put in your life. And so as a result, what ends up happening is that people try and fill that glory deficit in their hearts with life from outside. Now, in New York, you can say to someone, I hate you, and they couldn't care less. Whatever, I hate you back. I don't even feel your hate because of my returned hate. So it's like people aren't afraid of conflict in this city. People aren't afraid of different opinions. It's not the big thing. You know what people are terrified of of in New York? Not mattering. They're terrified of being irrelevant New York never cared that you came, doesn't care that you're here, and won't care when you're gone. Welcome to New York. We've been waiting for you. (laughs) There's something inside all of us, and this is probably what drew you here, that says, I need to matter. And that's that glory deficit in your heart. Sometimes when people accomplish something, what they're trying to say is, look, look, I do matter. When people date the right person, can't wait to post that, look, someone does want me. Graduate from the right school, hit the right milestone, get the right apartment, whatever it is. What you're saying is, please see that I matter. There is a deep existential dread in our hearts of being insignificant and inadequate. Your 20-minute little yoga stretch where you play you're worthy over and over is not going to heal your inadequate spirit that is there because of sin. Because here's what you know. You're not worthy. You're broken. 
We've fallen short of the glory of God. We're trying to medicate that deficit with human accomplishment. New York City runs on vain glory. Don't bring that culture of vain glory into the Christian community and use the church to fill your glory deficit. Well, how does it, so, that was the right response. <laughs> how does this manifest? So that vain glory, that empty glory, that craving to fill that, that inadequacy manifests itself by manipulation and selfish ambition, which means you begin to, so he's saying this like, in, that's how New York works, but don't let this be inside you. Don't bring this into the Christian community. Selfish ambition. The word that's used here in the Greek was uh, only or was formerly utilized in Aristotle's Politica, where it's, it's trying to analyze the course of various political uprisings. Certain people would come along, greedy for a grasp of public office and willing to utilize unjust means to gain the position. And Paul's saying that sort of politicizing, selfish need for attention cannot exist inside Christian relationships inside the church. Do not do anything for selfish ambition. Ambition fundamentally is a good thing. Passivity is not godly. Most of the sin in the world is happening because of passivity. But it's selfish ambition, not ambition itself that is distorted. Why? Because selfish ambition requires two things, domination and recognition, which means you have to compete and beat other people and you need attention in doing it. So ambition, the desire to do the right thing is okay, but the desire to dominate and to be recognized for it can destroy a church culture. In James 3, it says, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. And so sometimes you can just see this, man, I can smell selfish ambition at the door. I'm like, you didn't take it off, I can smell it. And it's kind of like a posturing to be near leadership. It's worshiping in such a way that the right people notice you doing it. It's a desire to climb the ranks or, or hack your way into the inner core. Personal agenda. Vainglory with a strategy of dominating and getting recognition for doing it will poison a community of love. Eugene Peterson says this, centering life in the insatiable demands of the ego is the sure path to doom. There's a way of life that you're invited into. And then there's the way of doom. And the way of doom is about trying to fill that glory void by using other people. There's a visual artist named Andreas Varro, does amazing uh, sort of, critique, prophetic critique, if I could call it that, of modern culture. He did this picture of this mum. This is a, a hard picture here. Do it for the likes, baby. Using her kid. Look at me, look at me. Look at all those thumbs up. Have you ever posted something and not got as many likes as you wanted and been like, aw? <laughs> That's a micro glory void. There's something in you that's like, what, and this, what, listen, why do we make the images raunchy or more controversial, more likes, more attention? Feed the algorithm. Kim Kardashian, the Kardashians have, have basically infiltrated the entire human story, and so why not the 4 p.m. surfers? Uh, Kim Kardashian said this. She just released a, a beauty line of products, and she said this. If you told me I literally had to eat poop every single day, and I would look younger, I might, I just might. And you know what? I, I believe that was a sincere statement. I think she said she'd, she'd put some kale with it, maybe some oat milk and quinoa, but I promise you, people will do insane things to deal with the insignificance of their spirit, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are wounded deeply and we cannot heal ourselves. It's going to kill us trying to do it. Andreas Vara has another image, and this is, this, is, this is what it leads to. Man. 
anthropologists a thousand years from now are going to dig us up. And they're going to be like, we discovered what killed them. We found it. We found the great extinction. What was it? Glory deficit. Here's what Paul says, to paraphrase. Do nothing out of selfish ambition for personal glory in in the church. Do nothing out of selfish ambition for personal glory. Number one, we've got to, got to fight against the poison of selfishness. Number two, then, is we have to build with an alternative reality, and that is building on the grace of Jesus. First thing we have to do with the grace of Jesus is we have to have a revelation of what he's done for us. Look at what it says, verse 1, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. Now, I just read in probably 25 seconds some of the most startling, revolutionary, soul-satisfying words the human heart will ever hear. This is what it says. It says, if you have any encouragement from union with Jesus. I want you to think about it. Here's what happens. You're you're lonely. You feel inadequate. You, You have sex with someone. You're sleeping with them. And you're trying to take some value from them to fill yourself. It's empty when the encounter's over or when the relationship ends. You try and unite yourself with your job. Give yourself to your career. Take from it. Then you get fired or transferred or whatever. Empty. But here's what he says. If you unite yourself with Jesus, there will be a well of life that will never run dry, that will water your spirit. The world can never do that. Jesus stood up in John 7 on the last and greatest day of the feast and said this, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, a well that will not run dry on the inside of you. And so when we're united with Jesus, what we get is encouragement from him. It's a a, a source that never runs dry. Then it says if you you had comfort from his love, This is what we forget. This word in the Greek is a beautiful word. It means to speak closely and intimate with someone. Most people think when you draw near to God, you're going to experience wrath and judgment. But if you draw near through the gospel of Jesus, you get intimate, quiet counsel for your wounded heart. Comfort from his love. And then he says this, common sharing in the spirit. You get to share in the Holy Spirit of God. Your dead spirit is made alive by his renewing power, then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, which is God's promise that he will never give up on you. Then you get a spirit of adoption inside of you that takes you from a a wounded orphan spirit into a chosen and wanted spirit. So you cry, Abba, Father. You've got a new orientation point for reality. Then when you're weak and you don't even know how to pray to him, he helps you pray to him. When you have no power, he gives you power. When you need to serve, he gives you gifts. And then you're baptized into the body of Christ and you get a new family. That's not bad. That's not bad. Common sharing in the Spirit. And then lastly, tenderness and compassion. Now the word tenderness is a a word that's used for both human tenderness and divine tenderness. But the word that's used in compassion is always related to God. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion the God of all comfort. James 5.11, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. So you bring your inadequacies, you bring your shame, you bring your insecurities, you bring that sense that no one gets you or understands you, and you bring that to God and you receive tenderness and compassion from Him. Amazing. So here's what we have to do. We must enjoy and delight in the satisfaction of his love. You've got to revel in that. You won the spiritual lottery. You sh- you sh- this should be nonstop party in the inner being. This is what you have in Jesus. We have a deeper sense at the core of our being of that glory being restored. We are being transformed from one degree of glory to another, and we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. 
Think about the city of New York trying to fill that glory void you got. I got a well of glory. I got Christ in me, the hope of glory. I'm good. You look tired. I look fresh. I'm good. <laughs> Without Jesus, we get limited hope, perpetual survival mode. We're scrounging. We're protective. We're fearful. We're defensive. And maybe you are here tonight and you came to New York and, and you're not a follower of Jesus. Someone brought you along tonight and you're like, oh my gosh, you are ringing my bell. Here's the thing. I, I'm not saying that getting like a little glory top up from sin or from the culture is not fun. It's just fragile and temporary. You may think, no, nah, no, nah, I'm beautiful. I've got all I need. You're beautiful for now, but give it 10 years. Botox is not going to cover that forever. You'll be eating poop before you know it with your girl, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Tell you right now, there's a kind of terror on aging models that is unlike any other terror. Me, then I'm killing it, man. I'm doing NFTs. I'm cryptoed up like, I've, like I am. I got all the stuff. For now, for now, you're only as good as last quarter. Temporary fragile. Here's what Jesus is saying to you. I've got something better. Come to me. Give it to me. That longing will never be satisfied by anything in this city. I will meet the deepest needs of your heart. This is how Miroslav Volf puts it. Christ came to transform us from never enough people to more than enough people. That through his poverty we may become rich. This city is filled with never enough people and this room is filled with more than enough people. What a community to be a part of, the beauty of the gospel. So we have to revel in this. This is a secret weapon in a fragile culture, a rock-solid source of life and joy. But it can't just be in your head. You can't just go, yeah, that's good, but then operate out of the system of the world. This has to be the truest thing about who you are. This has to be the ultimate reality that you draw from. It's got to be cultivated. So I can tell you this, the number one war in your life will be a war for intimacy in accessing this source. So once we got that in us, the grace of Jesus, he wants to work that through us so we build this community. Paul goes on and says this, I want you to be like-minded. I want you to have the same love. I want you to be one in spirit. And I want you to be of one mind. In the Greek, it literally says this, think the same thing, have the same love, be united in soul, and then think one thing. Now, I know that this sounds a little cultish, okay? But... It's, it's only a little bit cultish. Okay? It's not completely cultish. It's only a little. It's only tending towards cult-like. We are called to think Jesus' thoughts about life. We've got to be like-minded. We're called to love and want the same things. We're called to be united in our spirits, just to be like one in heart. And we're called to be of one mind. Can you imagine stepping into a room where people want the same thing? They see the same future. They treat each other differently than the world treats each other. And they have a completely different view of what the world should be and they're working towards it in love. That's what the church is supposed to be. And so we've got to let what Jesus has done in us come through us so we're not using people for the deficit, but we're building people to be a part of this alternative community. We also have to guard against division. Once, once you build this, man, you get to guard against division. This, this passage is, is kind of beautiful and poetic. You know, you, you could read it sort of Shakespeare. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's sort of like flowery and sentimental. But what's actually happening in the church of Philippi is there's a huge fight between two dominant women that's causing a crisis in the church. Eudia and Syneche are having a fight. And so Paul's writing this, do nothing out of selfish ambition. You want to know why? Because they're doing stuff out of selfish ambition. 
Do nothing out of vain glory because they're doing vain glory. There's politics and there's fighting and there's the flesh destroying the community. So he's got to remind them, don't let this be a part of your life together. Got to guard against division. In Titus 3, it says this, avoid foolish controversy and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because those are unprofitable and useless. Listen to this. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time and after that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They're self-condemned. Christians can sometimes be nicer than Jesus. When someone comes in to destroy community, you've got to remove them from the community for the sake of the community. Sometimes really critical people leave our church and they're like, are you going to chase after them? I'm like, heck no. Gossip behind people's backs, always criticizing everybody else. Don't get their way and they throw tantrums. No, that's division. They can come back when they mature a little bit. But that division will destroy this community. Warn them once, warn them a second time and have nothing to do with them. God's whole project is a project of unity and trying to get a bunch of strangers like us to be one in mind and one in heart and unite our spirits is about the most delicate thing on planet earth that you can work on. And that kind of love must be guarded. You, you're a gardener. Okay, we've got a house out in the Poconos, as you do. And uh, out in the Poconos, if you, there's, there's deer everywhere, terrifying. That, my dog got hoofed by the deer, got half its teeth knocked out. It's a very sad situation. Dog's not with us anymore. Deer are terrifying. But the worst thing about deer is they eat whatever you're trying to grow. And so you know what? You, you, put, a fence when it's, you put a fence around it to keep it out. Here's what Paul said, man, you've got to put a fence around the tenderness of your unity together. You've got to warn against it. You've got to guard against it because don't be naive and think that everybody's motives are pure. That's right. Paul says this, make my joy complete. A lot of people are like, well, I've got conflict with everybody, but my relationship with God is good. No, you're deluding yourself. You will never have peace with God if you've got conflict with everybody else. You're not hearing from God properly. And what Jesus says, before you go to the altar, if you've got a problem, go reconcile. We've got to be right with one another. Paul's like, make my joy complete. Be of one mind, be of one heart. So this kind of, so I want, I want us to see this, this kind of love that Jesus has done in us that has to come through us. We're going to have to fight for it and guard against it in order to realize our redemptive potential. Then number three, we have to have other-centered, culturally impossible love. Other-centered, culturally impossible love. Verse three again, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but also each of you to the interest of the others. Barbara Brown Taylor says this, the hardest spiritual work in the world is the love of the neighbor as the self. To encounter another human being, not as someone you can use, change, fix, help, save, enroll, convince, or control, but simply as someone who can spring you from the prison of yourself, if you'll allow it. Spring, others are the gift to spring you from the prison of self. A lot of people are like, I don't want to be a part of the church. It's so dysfunctional. It's just me and Jesus. Listen. Christianity is about love, and love requires other people. To remove yourself from the church, to try and be pure, is to commit to spiritual immaturity. You'll always have to leave the cell if you're a monk to go and inhabit the community. So how do we do this? Humility. Humility in this passage is literally rendered lowly of the earth. And it was a term used in Greco-Roman culture. It was always negative. They were an honor culture. And humility basically meant humiliation. Don't ever let people treat you like that. But I want you to see that this is about being so secure in who God has made you and what Jesus has done for you that you don't need to have to defend yourself. You can give yourself away in love. How did Jesus go to the cross and forgive his enemies? He was so secure in the Father's love. The first words 
out of Jesus' mouth that we read of this, I have to be about my father's business. And the last words out of Jesus' mouth were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 46 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus mentions Father. 11 times in the Sermon on the Mount, he mentions Father. Six times in John 17, he mentions Father. Because Jesus was committed and connected to the Father, he could humble himself and pour himself out because he had everything he needed within himself. It is only people who are secure that are freed up to serve. So he says, you got it, you got it. Once you're ready, you've got to humble yourself. Then he says... Uh, yeah, let me just, sorry, let me just uh, drop a little C.S. Lewis in here on this. I think this is important. Whenever we think about humility in the church, what do we think about? Like sort of people who are sort of, you know, about, you know, just, I'm, I just want to humble myself, you know. It's sort of like, you know, I don't want any attention. I just, you know, well, I'm not worthy. It's just, this is what C.S. Lewis says about true humility. Do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy Smarmy, that's a very British word, a smarmy person. He's a touch smarmy, to be honest with you, <laughs> who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. So this is just an orientation of other people. It's about being curious and finding people fascinating instead of being fixated on ourselves. We've got to cultivate this. It's not a natural instinct. Bonhoeffer in Life Together just gave a, a few like starting points on how to cultivate humility. Let these hit you. Is this your approach as you go to community groups? Is this your approach as you're in relationship with other people? He says, you've got to hold your tongue refusing to speak uncharitably about a Christian brother. It's just like the discipline of holding your tongue. There's so much to criticize about all of us, isn't there? I mean, where do we start? <laughs> you don't start, you hold your tongue. We've got to cultivate the humility that comes from understanding that others, like, oh, sorry, that, that us, like Paul, are the greatest of sinners and can only live in God's sight by his grace. We've got a view. What if we took every, what if we just went one by one, row by row, and pulled up every secret sin of your life? Just popped it on the screens and said, okay, let's just go have a little looky look here, right here, at your secret struggles and uh, the stuff that you just do when no one's around. Would that produce a touch of humility and less finger pointing? Oh, it would for me. So what does he say then? We have to cultivate this sense. Now, I am the chief. It's not you, it's me. This is we have to listen long and patiently so that we will understand our fellow Christians' needs. A lot of times people have all sorts of rhetorical strategies to guard people against the true needs of their heart, but every now and then under pressure, what we need leaks out. A lot of times people are not skilled at articulating the cry of their hearts because they're so controlled by fear of being hurt. This is Wittgenstein's whole philosophy about communication and understanding. You've got to listen. What are you trying to communicate with me? Not what are the words coming out of your mouth, but what's the cry coming out of your heart? And how do I hear that and discern that and respond to that? Refuse to consider our time and calling so valuable that we cannot be interrupted to help with unexpected needs, no matter how small or menial. If you think you're too good for that, can I just tell you, you're not. We have to bear the burden of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, both by preserving their freedom and by forgiving their sinful abuse of that freedom. Do you know how hard that is to do? I'm not going to control you because you're free in the Lord, but now I know you're going to use your freedom and it's going to hurt me and I'm going to forgive you when you hurt me. The kind of love that enables someone to grow like that. We have to declare God's word to our fellow believers when they need it and we have to understand that Christian authority is characterized by service and does not call attention to the person that performs the service. So you don't need to be mentioned when you serve. Romans 12, 16, be in agreement with one another, don't be proud, associate with the humble. So you, this has to be cultivated. We live in worlds where we're waiting to do our thing next rather than creating space to, to let others be who God's made them to be. And then we have to value others above ourselves. This is an interesting word in, in value. It's, it's got the word hype or hyper at the front of it. It's like, uh, it's, a, it's the modern version of, of super, like, oh, he's super cool. 
super good, bro. That is like, they are like super flexible. They're super rich. It's that, it's that little word that you put on the front of it to hype it up. This idea of valuing others or considering others literally means you carefully think about the excellence that is in other people and regard them as such. You see the whole of their humanity. You view them as more important than yourselves. Have you ever been in a room with someone in your organization who, who has more authority than you? Or in the world? I was in the Vatican, I met the Pope. Let me tell you, I wasn't sitting there going, I'm a really good, I, I, I'm a pastor in New York. Yeah. It's like I'm the pastor of planet Earth, you know what I mean? It's like, you know what I did? I just shut up. I shut up and said thank you when he gave me a book, okay? That was it. Because like, what was it like meeting the Pope? I was like, it was, it was uh, very humbling. What did you say to him? I'd said nothing to the Pope. I literally, I had nothing to say to him. The only thing I thought was, why am I here? You ever had a moment like that where you're literally like, this is literally not about me? Well, did you have that tonight coming here? Sitting with the people you're sitting next to you? Do you know who they are in the kingdom of God, the people next to you? Do you know how Jesus feels about the people sitting next to you? Can you believe you got to sit on that row with them? Now, I'm just grateful to be in this room. We have to see other people the way Jesus sees them. And then lastly, he says this, we have to look to the interests of the other, not our own. One translation says, considering the preference of others, not our own preferences. Now look, I don't, let me just give you a confession here, okay? Most of the criticism I get as a pastor is because you have preferences and your preferences are not happening in our church. So if I was to categorize the emails I get, they, they, they go like this. Thank you for the prayer culture of our church. Well, that's really created by others, so I deflect that. And then the other category of, of, is, is like this. Why aren't we more fill in the blank? Why don't we do more? And it's all just preference. Now, I, I want to be clear here. Some people have legitimate needs that our church cannot meet. And if it's, if it's a genuine need, I've got no problem. Someone says, yo, I've got to roll out. There's another church that has the capacity to legitimately meet this need in my life. And I'm like, hey, man, bless you. I, I understand that. If that's a real need. But I want to tell you, most people don't leave churches because they have real needs. They leave churches because they have frustrated preferences. And do you know how dangerous it is to build your entire faith around your preferences? All you're going to do is reinforce your strength and neglect your weaknesses, which means in the kingdom of God, you're just going to have all of these character flaws that God's going to have to discipline you in later. And there's going to be all these areas of your life He can't use you in because you're a spiritual infant. Listen, that was like a little harsh, but I love you. But you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? It's real. If you got these emails, sorry it slipped out. Listen, discipleship, only matters in the place you're undiscipled. And spiritual formation begins in the place you're not formed. And those are normally uncomfortable places of pain where we feel vulnerable and inadequate. And that's the place you want to meet Jesus. So again, that's why it's good to be in environments where you don't like everything. That's why it's good to be in groups where you don't like everyone. Because if, if you get everything you want and you like everyone around you, you're not in the kingdom of God. I don't know what kingdom you're in. I don't like what is that? Jesus, Jesus had problems with his own disciples. Jesus didn't get his own preferences met. It, it, it literally says this in the book of Romans. And so here's what I want us to say God loves us so much, he wants to give us something better than preferences. And you know what that is? Love. Love for other people in relationship. True love in its truest form delights in the satisfaction of the other, not in the gratification of the self. And you really know it's love when they get what they want and you don't need to get what you want. That's what the church is called to be. It's hard. It's, it's a challenge to do this. But he says, this is what the call is, to love each other like this. So just to recap, and then we'll wrap it up. We've got to guard against that poison of selfishness. You've got to build on the grace of Jesus. 
And then we have to have, as a part of our operating system, other-centered, culturally impossible love. That's got to mark out who we are. Okay, let's move from Philippi and their problems to New York and our problems, okay? The challenge of New York is that this is a place full of people trying to make it. Honestly, like you're here trying for Broadway because Kentucky Regional Theater was not enough for you. Yeah, no, yeah. You're doing 100 hours a week because Charles Stanley in Colorado won enough for you. Had to be Goldman. I'm, I, I'm not dismi- I'm here because, uh, like, I, I love it too. <laughs> I want to pass, I don't want to pass to Kentucky. I don't want to pass to Kentucky. I want to pass to you right here. It's a city full of people trying to make it. But we can't make the church a place where people are trying to make it. It's got to be a place where we love one another. Rowan Williams says this, we shall not find life by refusing to let go of our precious protected selves. We can't, we can't just have these, these fearful little hearts that we refuse to love and they're just ego-driven projects using New York for the glory void. No, we, got, we really got to just say, Lord, I'm going to need you to heal me. I'm going to need you to do a work in me. You need to examine your heart and your motives. What's your motive for being in this church community? It will never be totally pure. No, I don't think on this side of glory. But for the most part, it's like, man, I'm here because I want to love. I'm here because I want to give. I'm here because I want to serve. I'm here because I want to honor Jesus. That should be most of what's happening. Do I have an agenda? Am I going to use the church as a chaplain for my personal project of my life? Or am I going to use what God's given me to build the community up? That's the challenge in a place like New York. And so we've got to keep that poison of selfishness out and make this a culture of love. And then I think the second thing we have to do is we, we have to commit to building the beloved community. This was Dr. King's vision. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights activist, but he was, people forget he was a minister. He was a Baptist pastor. And his vision wasn't just a vision of social justice. It was a vision of Christian kingdom living. And this is what he wrote about the end goal of the work of justice. The aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community so that when the battle is over, a new relationship comes into being between the oppressed and the oppressor. Love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. The aftermath of the fight with fire method which you, suggest, which you suggest is bitterness and chaos. The aftermath of the love method is reconciliation and the creation of the beloved community. Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy, but it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, love, which means understanding, creative, redemptive, goodwill, even for one's enemies, enemies is the solution to the race problem. And so I said this, I want you to see this at a time of staggering division, He had a transcendent vision of a beloved community, the way of Jesus in the midst of the world. His life was taken before it could be fully lived out. But that's the call that we have, the beloved community of Jesus. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples by the quality of the preaching on Sundays. God help us? No. By the quality of your social media, by the quality of your facilities, by the games in your kids' ministry, by how many groups are immediately available, no, by the quality of your love. That means us becoming the beloved community that Jesus wants. It's not going to be built by my gifts or our staff team. It's going to be built by the way you show up with one another refusing a culture of selfishness, building on the grace of Jesus, putting others before yourselves, being the beloved community in a broken, selfish, chaotic world. Stanley Halvos says this, the most creative social strategy we have to offer is the church. 
Here we show the world a manner of life the world can never achieve through social coercion or governmental action. We serve the world by showing it something that it is not, namely a place where God is forming a family out of strangers. Look, there's a lot of pain around the things I'm talking about. I know some of you have been so hurt by the church. If, if I was to like show you the scars of my life, every single place of pain in my life has been done to me by followers of Jesus, not by the world. And yet here I am, man, still here. Because what's the alternative? Bitterness, shrinking back in anger, contributing to the dysfunction of our culture? No, it's, it's drawing on the renewing love of Jesus, the power of enemy love. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, like even tax collectors and sinners do that. But I tell you, love your enemies. Do good, pray for them, bless them. That's the kind of love our world's never seen. Wounds, pain. And, and it, we, we're not patient enough with one another because sometimes when, when you go from that like protected, precious self and you put yourself out there, sometimes you can go a little bit too much. Like, oh, a safe place. Oh, you know, just like, it's, and you're like, okay, man, boundary. Like, let's take this slow. Let's like emotionally date a little bit. For, like, you're just too much. too. It's like, it's messy. It's painful. It's hard. It's uncomfortable. And that's why love is patient. That's why love is patient. So I want to call us to be a place where God is forming, forming a family out of strangers and call us to be patient as we do this. Be patient as we do this. Jesus is so patient with us, isn't he? He's so patient. He's patient. He's patient with you. We sin, he forgives us. We get angry, he loves us. We give in a temptation, he's merciful to us. And we need to be that for one another. So my simple invitation is this, join us. New York is waiting for the body of Christ to look like this. Let's, let's be this. Let's be this. Let's be a community of defiant joy, countercultural love. Let's be a place where we build a family out of strangers. Amen. Maybe you're here tonight and um, you're like, you know, I sort of like lost it a little bit at the end there because you went a bit long. But let me tell you, when you were talking about that glory void, dude, you got me. Dude, you got me. That's me. I feel exposed and vulnerable. And I want to tell you right now, you know what that is? That is the love of God trying to rescue you from the, the vanity of trying to fill that apart from Him. And so I'll say, if you're not a follower of Jesus tonight, you can give your life to Jesus. You can exchange your sin, your emptiness, your brokenness for the life of God in your heart. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I realize I've fallen short of your glory. Thank you that you sent Christ to be with us, to take my sin, to rise again, to offer me salvation. You can just say, I receive it. It's about receiving it. The Bible says, to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. You can do that tonight. A well of living water inside of you. Maybe you're here and... Um, you're struggling with a little bit of bitterness in your heart. The Bible says this, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Let no bitter roots spring up among you, defiling many. Some of you have got bitterness and it is literally defiling the sincere love of the people who are around you. Complaint is leaking out. Criticism is leaking out. Judgment is leaking out because there's a bitter root in your heart. I believe tonight God wants to heal you of that, to get into your spirit and pull it up at that point of pain and replace it with love and grace, the grace of God that you've been shown. So if you need freedom from that tonight, you're just like, I can't do this on my own. I need help. we have got a prayer team here. They'd love to be able to pray for you. And maybe you're here and you're like, I'm in, but I'm powerless to do this. And you're just like, God, I'm in, but give me power. Well, that's how kind he is. He gives us power to love. And uh, so tonight, maybe your response is simply to say, Lord, here's my life. I, 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 I renounce selfish ambition. I renounce vain glory, and I just receive your love. Give me power to love people like this. So let's just take a moment. Can we just bow our heads before the Lord, just create a place of response? I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and to speak to you deep in your heart. So Holy Spirit, I just pray right now that you would just come and search every heart and mind of every person who's just heard 
the Word of God. Father, your Word says that the Bible is living and active. And it's able to discern to soul and spirit. It's able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that your word would reveal tonight any area of bitterness that needs to be repented of or healed. Holy Spirit, I pray right now you would physically manifest your presence in people's bodies so that they know you're talking to them. I just pray a weight on their chest, a hand on their back, something that says, it's you and it's time. Come Holy Spirit, free your people from bitterness. Father, I just want to ask if there's anybody who's here and they feel guilty or filled with shame because of ways that they have tried to medicate their insignificance and insecurity and the enemy's using that to hold them back. I just want to pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, a spirit of freedom would come over them. Just pray they would walk in freedom. Lord, your word says, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So, Father, I just pray tonight, anybody struggling with shame, you restore spiritual confidence in the name of Jesus. I pray literally thoughts would leave their mind, guilt would leave their heart, shame would leave their bodies, and joy and life and forgiveness and light and freedom would fill them, Lord God. And, Father, I pray for those who, they're just so tired of trying to build the church and it just feels like, two steps forward and two steps back. I just pray you would just release fresh vision tonight of being this kind of community, humble, other-oriented, giving preference to others. I just pray sustaining grace, the patience of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. So I just pray, Father, right now, where there's been exhaustion, where there's been frustration, I just pray you would just, Holy Spirit, right now, release hope, New ideas, new relationships, new joy literally would well up within people. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, we've all taken a beating the last two years. COVID, politics, division, culture wars. Refresh our hearts that we may love again and be the people of Jesus in our world. Come Holy Spirit, minister to your people. Shape us into the image of your Son. Make us the church that you had in mind. Amen. If you look up at me just for a minute, if you sense the Holy Spirit speaking to you tonight, I want to encourage you to come forward for prayer to sort of mark this moment. You know what it is to be in a room in the middle of New York City and the God of the universe is talking to your heart? Don't take that lightly. He wants to do a deeper work. He's just, he's just tapping you on the shoulder. Wait till you get the full embrace. It's an invitation for more. So I just want to say, if the Holy Spirit's touched you in any way tonight, conviction, encouragement, a need to repent, a need for hope or whatever, I just want to encourage you to stand to our feet right now. And I want to encourage you to come forward. We can all stand together. This is all of us standing. And if you want to take what God's done in your row and seal it, I want to encourage you to come forward. We've got a, a wonderful team of trained prayer counselors, and they'd love to just join with you agree with you about what God's done in your spirit and just bless the work of God. So we're going to go into a time of worship. This is not a time of singing. It's a time of response. It's a time where the seed of what God's done in your heart is cultivated in response so that a deeper work of the Holy Spirit. So if you sense the Holy Spirit has spoken to you in any way tonight, I want to encourage you. We've got prayer uh, counselors with lanyards around the room. Maybe you want to just do business with God wherever you are. But let's not hear the Word of God. Let's not look intently into the mirror and then deceive ourselves and go away unchanged. Let's respond to what God's spoken to our hearts tonight. So let's move into worship and move into a time of response together.